I know you're going to dig this. This is Ryan McGlynn, host of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center's award-winning show, Funk Chronicles, recorded live here at DATV Studios in Dayton, Ohio. And today, my guest is Debbie Sandridge, a friend and former executive producer of Mo. Town Records. Welcome. Hi. Hi, old friend. How uh, are you? You know what? This is just so <laughs> great. It's just so exciting to think that to come from a Dunbar High School mm -hmm. and uh, all the time that we played and, and here we are on Funk Chronicles talking about your musical journey through the music industry and during the, especially the funk era. So, how did you, I didn't even know you were, I knew you played softball, but I never <laughs> knew you were interested in music. So, how did you get started? I've always loved music. My father loved music. My mother loved music. My brother still plays the trombone. So, we had music around us as I grew up. And we would listen to music like from Dakota State and then. Ooh, My yeah. sister loved Johnny Mathis, okay, and so I, I was introduced to music in that way, and I always felt that was really special. Um, then as years passed on, I had the opportunity to manage a group called Dayton, that's from here. Um, that was Sean Sandridge's group, and I started understanding the backside of what happens. You know, they're, enter they're the entertainers on stage, and they're the people who get in the studios and, do, and, and, you know, handle the engineering, technical aspects. That always fascinated me, but I wanted to know more about how it all came together. So as I worked with the group and um, I learned, I learned every aspect that I possibly could from the studio to the publishing world to what happens inside the record company, who's making those decisions. Who makes that choice? Then it, it became fascinating to me. And to kind of make it not so long. Okay, so then what happened was some of the people that I worked with at Capitol Records during that time started hiring me. Um, they recognized that I had some skills and ability, which of course I love that part. <laughs> and I um, started working for other artists throughout the country, actually. Um, now, exactly what was your role? Because, uh, so what I'm hearing is that you got your start as a on-the-job training as the management mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. Dayton. Right. Okay, and so during, how long did you manage Dayton? I would say at least, this is how I count it. I count it as like four albums, okay? okay. okay. <laughs> if that makes okay. any yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah. So during that time, you you have to do, you're the, you're, you have to control the finances. You have to work with the record company in order to get the money put in place. You have to oversee the studio time. You have to work with them to get the right music, the right producers. All those things come into view. So as I developed and I worked closer with the record company, the one thing I realized is that the most the part that I like most was A and R, okay? That's artist and repertoire, okay? So, so exactly what is that? When you're an A and R person, you have the good fortune to become an A and R person. You do make decisions, okay? 
you can sign new talent. You can work with established talent. You put the product together, which of course is most important to the labels. You've got to have product. Um, and I was fortunate. I worked, um, one of the people I knew at Capitol went to Motown Records, okay? And he was vice president of a and at, at Motown Records. That was Steve Buckley. And as Steve was there, he wanted, he was looking for someone to be his assistant. I was still in Dayton, but we had worked together throughout the years. And he asked me if I would come to LA and work for Motown Records as his assistant. So of course I said yes, knowing all the time I wasn't going to stay the assistant, okay? Um, so as things developed, I, I can't begin to tell you how fortunate that road, that journey has been for me. I mean, it, it's almost like a fairy tale. You move to L.A., you get off the plane, you go to work at Motown Records the next day, okay? During that time, you advance. During that time, you meet Barry Gordy. During that time, I had the privilege of going to his home and him teaching me things about the industry that, you know, you, you, that just doesn't happen. Um, but it did. So as I went through becoming the best A&R person I could be, I always remembered the things that A&R people would say to the band that I managed that would just upset them to no end, okay? They would come out of those meetings, those guys would be like furious. How dare them say that to me about my music? You know, this is who we are. We don't want to do what everybody else is doing. See, I remembered those lessons. So as I became an A&R person, I was very careful about what I said to people about their creativity. Um, one of the first assignments I had at Motown, I actually was executive producer on an album for Stacy Lattisaw. Oh, okay, I remember, remember Stacey, that? I remember <laughs> Stacy Lattisaw. So that was a lot of fun, and Stacy was going through a transition at the time. Stacy had become a young woman. She was no longer the little girl that everybody had become to love, and this is Stacy, and you know her little songs. So um, I learned right away that you had to listen to the artist. This is their career. This is their choices. Okay. At the same time, you have to put together products that's marketable to that day, because that's important too. Okay. Um, more than important, I should say. And then following that, um, I, I was introduced to the Minneapolis scene during the time when, you know, the whole world was Prince and everybody that oh, came from there. Oh, we talked when I was there. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, yeah. Wow. And I, um, I was fortunate enough to sign, sign Brown Mark. He had been the bass player for Prince and the Revolution. Okay. So I signed him to Motown, and I remember at that time there being a big deal about which label was going to sign Brown Mark. Well, I didn't have all the money that Warner Brothers had or, or MCA at that time, but I did have Barry Gordy, okay? And so I was able to take that artist to Barry Gordy's home and let him sit and meet with him and learn the importance of being an artist on Motown Records, something that's so legendary. Just absolutely legendary. And then from there, I had the opportunity to produce an album. Well, I was executive producer, not the producer, um, for The Temptations. How much fun was that? <laughs> yeah, we grew up on The Temptations. We? Since this, think about it. You were working with them. Yeah, yeah. How was that? It's a privilege, and it is funny, and it was... You see all these personalities, okay? Everybody has an important part, and everybody wants to make sure that their part is heard. Um, selecting music with them, you know. I could send out to the biggest writers in the world. I have Temptation Project, and I'd get music from every place, okay? Then you'd get to select producers. I remember working with Michael Cimbella and, and uh, Dick Rudolph, actually, when um, on a song for the Temptations called Soul to Soul. The album that we did was called Special, and it did quite well for them, 
okay? But it was just, um, it's an amazing experience. When you grow up, as we did, listening to The Temptations, listening to Diana Ross, I worked with Stevie Wonder on a Diana Ross project. Oh, how was that? Fascinating. I'm sure. He's funny, okay? Um, and being in his studio and watching how he maneuvers everything was, is, is simply amazing. And to work with somebody as talented, as gracious, and as lovely as Diana Ross for all the years that I did was just an honor. Just an honor. She is so smart, okay? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And let's see, who else did I work with that was fun? Pointer Sisters, love those oh, girls. Oh, Pointer Sisters, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I got to work with them. And uh, let's see, we did Elder Barge. And one of my favorite artists, because I love the ability, the, the quality of the vocals and everything like that, was uh, Gerald Austin, who was lead singer for the Manhattans. You know? Yeah. So when you get in the studio and you have the opportunity, to hear these voices and watch how these people work and to sit there and have selected songs for them, select a producer for them, okay? It's quite an honor. It's, it's like the best gig ever, okay? I mean, this is just so fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. uh, all, all I've ever wanted to be was a roadie. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were important too. Yeah, but but the, the, well, now did you have anything to do with their touring engagements? Not really. They all had separate uh, booking agencies, and they had their own management and everything. You know, I didn't have anything to do with their touring. Although I went to many shows, okay, because sometimes that's the only way I could get to them. I would gather up the music and I call the management and say, "Hey, I'm coming to uh, Caesars." I'll be in Las Vegas because we have to listen to this music. So we'd get in the dressing room before they went on stage or after, and I'd pull out my bag of goodies and we'd all sit there and we'd listen and say, we like this, we like that, we don't like this, who's gonna be the producer? So a lot of the album was put together in that way. Hmm, now how, how do you get paid? How did you get paid doing that? Did you get a salary from Motown? Oh yes. Or do you get, or do you get a, percentage as an A&R person? I was paid directly through Motown. I had a very nice salary, very nice expense account. You had everything you could ever want in doing that. I didn't participate in a lot of the royalties and the points. I never felt that my contribution, my contribution was paid for, okay? I never felt that I had the right to, the, to that artist or that producers, you know, to say, I, I deserve a piece of this. That's their work. So, you know, I was paid very well. Did, did you help the artists understand uh, about the, the legal aspect of what they were doing so that they would get their fair share? All of that's ha handled by the artist's legal team. Oh. When you come into the industry, especially during that day, you had to have your own legal team. You had to have what we called back then the deal, you know? So the deal was cut prior to it getting to my desk. So whatever they were going to get from that deal, okay, was already pre-established before they got to me. So now how would you train for something like this? I mean, you did it through the, I call it the OJT, <laughs> on the job training uh -huh. program. But if someone was interested today, how do you think they would go about getting into the A&R with all of the um, social media and, and streamlining of music on people? You know, how I tell has you. The music, I guess the question is, how has the music industry changed so since your uh, journey? Oh, it's, it's an extreme change. It's an extreme change. I wouldn't venture back into that for anything, okay? Um, I'm not saying that it's bad, because I think everything should change. I think that we had our era of music that we loved. Some of our parents didn't, if you recall those things. And then, you know, it came to the era where I was able to participate and to have an opinion um, that would go out to the world. You know, that, that's a big deal. Um, but today, 
it kind of goes, Ryan, to one of the things that we know about everything. It's kind of who you know. You know, I was able to work my way into a situation where my abilities and skills were recognized. Fortunately, they were recognized by someone who said, hey, I want you to come aboard. You know what I mean? Um, now the young producers, the young publishers, uh, publishing is such a major aspect of it. When you get your legal team, make sure you've got your publishing straight. And they have to understand that. They have to know that this is, this is where they make their money, you know? And there's a lot of different ways to go about it as they choose their performance rights organization. Am I going to be an ASCAP writer? Am I going to be a BMI writer? Am I going to be a CSEC writer? All those different elements come into play. When I left the music industry, when I decided I was too old to rock and roll, okay, <laughs> I went to a music college in Minnesota. And I absolutely loved that experience. Um, there I had an opportunity to take the knowledge that I had developed over the years, okay, and bring it to this young generation who had all those hopes and dreams. And one of the things that I was able to do to put them in the positions of an ANR or um, in these days uh, film and things like that was I set up internships. I set up career internships for them. So when the young people came in and, and many of them studied music business, some of them, of them were musicians, some of them studied engineering and production. So through their courses, they had, they had that understanding of what publishing was like. How does this whole thing work? So then once they saw that, I was just more than happy to just call friends and say, hey, I've got some young kids. They're in Minnesota, but we'll get them to L.A. and let them internship. I have young people now that work for Netflix, work for Fremantle, you know, who are major publishers and A&R people in Nashville. So those are the things that are important. You know, when, when I'm looking, uh, listening to you talk about your career, and you, you highlight some of the people, like with Prince and the Revolution, his drummer, mm -hmm. uh, Stacey Lettisa, um, the Diana Rosses, the, the Temptations, the Stevie Wonders. And I know there's some more that you mm -hmm. have worked with that are just as famous mm -hmm. or maybe not so famous. Right. But I, I think that uh, their personalities, and I guess that's a question that I have uh, curi curiosity on, is that are the, the artists that sometimes we see, are there their personalities or is that their showmanship? Give me an Diana example. Ross, Diana Ross is the best entertainer you will ever see. When she steps onto that stage, it just becomes magic. She knows how to hold the audience. She knows the right steps to do. And it's just a natural ability. Um, I think that all of them, I think that all of them, everybody that we've named, everybody I work with, when it comes to that tour, when it comes to being on that stage, they're out to satisfy. They really are. That's the most serious thing to them. I mean, I've watched the Pointer Sisters I've watched from, and often, you know, I'd be at the show and backstage looking on, and I've watched those girls be able to change vocal parts at the drop of a hat, you know, not planned, not rehearsed, but they're on stage. They're doing what they do, okay? They take their rehearsals very seriously, very, very seriously. Um, and, and so that person on stage is different from that person that I would sit with across the table, okay, and make plans for what that album or the next album was going to be. And the Pointer Sisters, um, I, and, you know, it became very popular doing what, uh, Hollywood Cop or something that, uh, um, that they had a song, uh, well, Eddie Murphy was in that. Oh, Beverly Hills Cop, I think it was something it was like that. that. One and, and they had they had so and, and, many major and, and, hits and, and, and yeah, things. And, yeah, and you know, one of the air, major airlines was using their yeah. music. And you know, I think on basketball games and things, you'll you'll still hear. I'm so excited, you know, 
and songs like that, um, they were fascinating, but so were the Temptations, okay? And so was Elder Barge in his own way. Yeah, and, and, yeah. El, and Elder Barge has been to Dayton a few yeah. times. Mm -hmm. um, and who else did you, we, you know, we, those were the ones that first came to your mind, but as we talk, who else did you work with? You know, I, I had the privilege of, of working with a lot of famous producers, okay? I worked with Peter Asher, okay? And Peter Asher, um, oh God, now I can't think of the name of the act. He's done many major acts, but they were pop producers. The Michael Cimbellos, the Dick Rudolphs. I worked with the James Anthony Carmichael. Uh, who, that's a name yeah. I know. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, we did that on the Diana Ross Project. I also worked with him on, uh, on the Pointer Sisters. I worked with Nick Martinelli, okay? Very famous for pr producing Stephanie Mills and, and uh, Phyllis. Um, Hyman? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for that. A lot of names running through my hat. So we, you know, so it, bec it becomes a family. And some of the producers you work well with, and others you don't. You know, it's um, it has to become now. What is a the producer's plan. job? The producer's job is to take the song or to find a song, and that artist, and develop each musical step, put it all together. Okay, they record the instruments, they record the artist, they put everything, get everything ready for what we call the mix, as you well know. Okay, and then you know they themselves either are the mixer or they hire a, a specific mix engineer. But their responsibility is monumental. I mean, it's like the whole thing. Well, it makes or breaks a song. Oh, it? absolutely, it makes or break an artist. Yeah, that's you know, true. if you have a producer that's a great vocal producer, like Nick Martinelli, okay, you're going to hear a certain quality. You're going to hear them find that spot. Uh, that works for that artist, and and it's it's notable, you know. You have someone like James Anthony Carmichael, one of the he's he was he's just so quiet, you know, and and of course running into me that was really something. <laughs> um, but we have wonderful times together, and his ear, that song selection, producers have to have great ears, you know. There's there's just no way around that. I think that. Often it's overlooked, people talk about talent. And we talk about people being on stage and if they're singing, if they're dancing. It's the ears that make all the difference in the world. Uh, I would think that Stevie Wonder has a great ear. Oh my God, what a character, okay? We did an album, um, the first album I did with Diana Ross was called Force Behind the Power, okay? And he did the title track for us, all right? And he decided he wanted a choir. And then he was going out of the country. So he, and this is long before people were using things like Pro Tools, believe me. This was, and so he was in like Paris someplace. I'm just using that as an example. But he was mixing this song from his studio, okay, because he had all those capabilities. I mean, everything. Stevie is, 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 when people talk about him being amazing, that's almost an understatement. He's a genius. Yeah, Ryan, I like that. He's a he genius. is. And he's a, he's a wonderful person. He's a wonderful person, you know. So, yeah, it was, it, it's been a, a great time, you know. I worked with some artists that weren't famous, artists who wanted the opportunity. I always try to take a moment to listen to those things that would come in. We would be bombarded, believe me. I can imagine. With unsolicited material. And, you know, that's another part of our job. And you look at this box and you go, whoa, what am I going to do with this? You they know? send you a bunch of demos and things like that? Yeah, uh -huh. and, and many of them, if they come in unsolicited, they got a stamp put on them unsolicited and they were returned. You know, it's. I don't know if it's easier for artists today because of the numerous outlets or whether it's more difficult. Artists, when, you know, I was in the 80s, okay, you know, it was something to get your hand on a studio, a four track or anything. Yeah. You know, if you, if you were capable of doing that, that was half the battle. Now they don't have that struggle. 
There are so many tools that are right there for them. So what that means is that the numbers are even greater. So competition is stiffer. You know? When you when you look at it when you look at it from that perspective, but these people who were sending in this material, I would always think this person's going through an extra step. Now don't get me wrong. I've listened to some of it and Lord have mercy, it's been awful, okay? <laughs> and but every now and then you might come across something that makes you pick up the phone and call the person, you know, and just recognize that they went through this effort and that it wasn't ignored. Um, Rhonda, uh, Dinah Ross's oldest daughter, was my intern for a summer, okay? And she would look at that box of tapes, well back then it was cassettes, and she'd go, <laughs> oh Debbie, <laughs> we have to do something with this. I said, help yourself. <laughs> After a couple of weeks, she came back and she goes, now I understand. And that's, that's, that's what it takes. It takes understanding that people want certain things in their lives. Everybody's just not going to have that opportunity. Um, some people are more talented than others. And you and I have both seen people that may not be quite so talented, but they're up there at the top. Yeah, yeah. You know, I always think about um, our infamous talent shows that, that would happen <laughs> in uh, the high schools and things oh, when we yeah. were going. There were some very, very talented people yeah. came through, came through uh, the high schools in Dayton during right, that time. Right. Very, very talented. And the local band era yeah, yeah, yeah. was very, very strong. It was. Very strong. And, um, and, and but what, two things I want to, to, to talk to you about is one of the things that made it so exciting about having you is that you're a female. And we really don't think of females in the behind the scenes or in A and R and those type of uh, jobs, and those are very important and influential jobs. And you know, here you were there. Oh yeah. <laughs> and and, and, um, and I mean, tell me about that experience. Well, you know, the interesting as, thing as was, a female. Um, and you're right. Back in those days, of very few, very few female, especially in an A and R. Um, but that was another one of the blessings of being at Motown. And an African American. Yeah. Female. Yeah. At that. Okay. Yeah. And being at Motown, the, you know, it was like Barry Gordy looked for talent. He didn't care. See, if you recall, Suzanne DePass came from uh, Barry Gordy and the Motown. And she went on to be a great executive producer of films and everything. But he would identify that talent. And it didn't matter to him that you were a female. It was a little rough sometime. Um, some of the older guys in the industry, you know, they, they kind of bristled at the thought of, oh dear, she's going to do the Temptations album, you know? That just would be across the, the industry. So you, even though I didn't put it front and center, I'm here to tell you I was going to prove myself, okay? Because we can do this too. And it's important that we have a voice and that we can do it. And then I could show up at the studio and quote unquote hang out with the guys and still be my professional self and at the end of the day get the best product that's possible, okay? So yeah, it, it, it could be and sometimes was a challenge, but Ryan, you know, it's one of those things. You see something that's important to you. I had the opportunity to put my opinion out there, okay? And let the world decide whether they like my ideas or not. You know, pioneering mm -hmm. is um, one of those things that uh, a lot of people forget about the unsung sheroes and heroes mm -hmm. that pioneer to allow them to be able to do the things that they do. And, and, and I see you, Debbie, as one of those unsung uh, sheroes of the industry because we know who you are. Mm -hmm. But a lot of folks 
may not know, and that's why this this show is so important to to get your story in here. And this is just fascinating to me. And what funksters did you work with? Well, if, see, that was one of the things I shared with David when I spoke to him. When it came to funksters, hmm. You see, I, I was in that R&B pop sector yeah. so much because of the artists that I worked with. Now, here's a little bit of something. Around 1996, I think it was, I went to work um, for a record company that was distributed by Geffen called John Doe Records, D-O-U-G-H, okay? okay? The head of that record company was Pat Charbonnet who was also executive producer with Ice Cube one Friday, okay? So I, and I don't know if people consider this funk, I consider it hip hop, but I guess it all comes down to somewhat the same. Because I worked with um, producers on that level like DJ Quick, okay? And, and so, and that's how I was introduced to Ice Cube. All right. Who, by the way, Ice Cube would come to the school in Minnesota, and we had an Ice Cube scholarship as well there. Mm -hmm. So you know, it, 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 you 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 kind of get into it, um, but I, that's what I would guess I'd have to consider um, my footstep into something funky. <laughs> but you know, the, the the thing is this: when we think about funk music, yeah. Funk is a title that encompasses, mm -hmm. encompasses really the African American music mm -hmm. genre. Uh, from whether it's from Duke Ellington okay. to, 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 to James Brown, which you know a lot of times they credit James Brown as being the father of funk. Mm -hmm. And so when, when we look at our music, the R and B and all of that, because remember, our music had to be a sidebar from what they would call rock and roll oh, totally. because of Elvis Presley and those guys. Mm -hmm. And so our music, when we think about funk music, we think about, we may think about an era, but it's all encompassing of, of, of our music as I yeah. see it. I, I agree with that statement. It's. Um you know, and we all kind of see it in different ways. I mean, there, there are songs that uh, were produced on many artists that I considered funky or funk music. And I, I almost hate to um, label any genre that I've worked in. Um, because you're right, it is. It all comes together, it, it just, and, it's, it's, and just, it's part of it. You know, it's just it's, inner me. You it know, does. You know, the kids now do all these hand things <laughs> like this, and so when I'm thinking about our music, I can do all these hand things to uh -huh. say it's all mixing in. But, but leading up to the the funk museum, mm -hmm. at which there is no better place for it to be, or even give a second thought than the Dayton, Ohio. Oh, I agree with that. And and I need you to tell me why you think that uh, the Funk Museum is important and why it should be in Dayton, Ohio. I think that what you guys are doing is important because it claims and it establishes our foothold in the music industry from years ago to possibly even today. We don't know what young people may go by the Funk Museum and stand there and say, this is where I want to go. This is what I want to do. And to know that there were people before them that had the opportunity, who used it wisely. All the interviews that you do with different people, they're fascinating. And you're right, people have to have knowledge of what someone has done before they can even get an idea about what they might want to do. I just think the fact that it's in the library is important. That's why I'm here today, okay? Because if I can make a contribution to young people coming up along the way, as you do each time you do an interview, <laughs> then I'm all there. You know, one of the things about these interviews that's been really, um, I always try to pursue from the artists is that, from your experience, and we know that uh, experience is the best teacher, <laughs> 
What would be three things that, from your experience, from your area of the A&R, mm -hmm. uh, would you say were the pluses and the minuses to look out for? Creative people are very different, and it's hard to give, um, to, to broadly say that you should look out for this, or you should look out for this, because of the fact that um, it's going to be different. Their experience is going to be unique to them, okay? So you can set up rules, you can set up guidelines, this is what you do, you put it on YouTube, you put it on, you know, but I think that it should always go back to, and this is going to sound so old-fashioned, it should always go back to the song. Okay, I think the first thing that people have to recognize is that I have something to say. I have a way that's going to be pleasant to the ear. And no matter who listens to this, be it an A&R person, okay, or a producer, or a publishing company, that this is something someone's going to want to hear, okay? Because once again, it all gets back to the ear. Um, I think that you have to be careful about who you decide to collaborate with um, because that collaboration, be it with a legal team or a management team or another songwriter, could be detrimental to your future or something. Um, and I think you just have to believe. You got to believe. You just got to believe that this is the road for me, that I can do this. And regardless of what you hear along the way, keep on your path, you know. Now, I'm not saying that you do that until you're 80, okay? <laughs> but if you're a young person right now, and you really believe you've had the talent, and you you've not only have talent, but you've enhanced your skills, enhanced those skills, so that you, you have to stand out among the field, okay? You can't be the same. You have to be unique. That, you know, that is something that is really important that, that, is, that you see among the young people today. Mm -hmm. they, they all want to be a light, but they want to consider themselves unique. I'll figure this out later on, I think. <laughs> but, but um, yeah, and, and during the time that, which is really um, unusual, I think, is the fact that during the time that, during the 50s and the 60s, uh, and the 70s, people were not afraid to be who they were. No. To be unique. Mm -hmm. And to be as outrageous as they may want to be. And nobody really gave it a Second thought, because remember, we grew up during a time where men wore man bags, <laughs> platform <laughs> shoes, yeah. bell bottoms, and plaids, and stripes, and polka dots, and big hats, and glasses that had rhinestones. I mean, it was, it, it was just a, a, an era where people were allowed to be themselves. And then somewhere along now, they talk about conformity, but but they still want to strive to be different, but they're still alike. <laughs> so yeah. it, it's, uh, it, it's one of those things I'm still trying to marinate in my mind of what this is, even with the music. Sometimes if you listen to the music, you cannot tell the difference from one song to the next song. And whereas in our era that we're talking about with the funk music, mm -hmm. it had a message. Mm -hmm. It had a message. and and especially if you can, can recall when we were growing up, whatever mood you were in, mm -hmm. there was a song. Right. There was a song. <laughs> you had a theme song for whatever was going on your, in your life. And like one of my favorite songs was always uh, Under the Boardwalk. Okay. Or, and that's when I, and then when things got me down, I like Up on the Roof. <laughs> and, you know, or what was it? A little bit of soap. Oh, or, my God, and, yeah. And uh, uh, How to Succeed in Love. You know, all these little songs you listening to uh, to try. And then, you know, then we had all the dance music mm -hmm. that. Uh, and, and so uh, I find it just so fascinating as I'm making this transition 
in the music uh, that uh, the funk is coming back. The old music hasn't gone away because it has words you can hear and listen to and, and repeat. Now, and of course, our, I'm sure that the young people, when you hear it, the, the, the background music sometimes is so loud, you don't know what they're saying. <laughs> but, and then maybe you're better off when you start hearing what they're saying. But the good news is that we've moved to an era now where they can actually put the clean version on. So, uh, you know, the technology has, has changed and, you know, you, you hear about some of the artists dropping their music. On. Ryan, the world has changed. It has and changed. And that's, that's what happened with the music. The music, I mean, when you and I grew up, we had one or two radio stations to listen to, <laughs> okay? Um, these kids today, they're bombarded with everything, okay? It's hard to stand out in a crowd anymore because the crowd is so large, okay? But those artists today who are the top artists are unique. They have to be. You have to be. They you have to be able to identify them on the radio from anybody else, you know, or you go, oh my goodness, is that Rihanna? Is that so and so, you know? Um, what, they, what they choose to talk about and identify with, with today is. Uh, very I, it's very, very. Interesting, and I, I do believe that it's because of the way that technology has just moved forward so quickly. And these kids have so much exposure. You know, when we first got cable TV, if you recall, <laughs> you know, you, 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 it, things happened. They had stations called After Dark and things like that. I don't think they do that anymore. I just think it's all the time, you know, whether it's <laughs> Netflix or or whatever they're watching. So their attitude toward the world is so different than ours. It really is. Communication, you know, their ability just to pick up the phone and say what they want or to tweet or to, we didn't do all of those things. We didn't have all of that. No, but you know, didn't. but then the one thing of all of the things that we've talked about that is still constant, that's music. Oh, totally. Music yeah. is, it, it, you know, it's the eyes, it, 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 it's the sound to the soul. It's the common denominator. It's the common denominator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it, it crosses all racial lines. Absolutely. All gender lines, all ethnicities. Mm -hmm. Music is it. And, and, and funk has a really, truly special place in all of this. I agree. And with that, I'm going to thank Miss Debbie for being with us and say this is Ryan McGlynn, host of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center's award-winning show, Funk Chronicles. Until the next time, keep it funky. Here we go.